Every time you swipe your credit card, a 50-year-old system makes a decision about your money in about 300 milliseconds. Here is what actually happens when you tap your credit card at Starbucks. Your card talks to the Visa or MasterCard network. The network routes it to your bank. The bank runs a few basic checks. Is this card valid? Is there enough credit? Does this look like fraud? If everything passes, approved. If not, decline. That's it. That's the entire decision-making process. Static rules written by your bank, running on mainframe logic designed in the 1970s. And you have exactly zero control over any of it. Which means you can't tell your card, hey, block me from Amazon after 10 p.m. when I make terrible decisions. You can't say, only let this virtual card at Uber and cap it at $200 a month. Your credit card is probably the dumbest piece of technology you use every day. But what if there was a step in between? What if, right before your bank says yes or no, your own code could run? That's the idea behind programmable credit cards. You get an API, you get webhooks, you get to write rules that execute at transaction time. In that 300 milliseconds window, deciding whether a purchase should go through. It's basically serverless functions, but for your wallet. In this video, we are going to break down exactly how this works under the hood. We'll look at the technical architecture, the APIs, the webhooks, the transaction flow. I'll show you real use cases, including one developer who built a system that declines his own purchases on the first swipe, just to make himself think twice. This deep dive is sponsored by ClutchCard, who are actually building exactly this. More on them in a bit, but first, let's understand the architecture. So, how does a credit card transaction actually work? When you tap your card at a coffee shop, a lot happens in under a second. The merchant's point of sale terminal reads your card details and creates what's called an authorization request. This is basically a message that says, hey, this person wants to spend $5.40 at this location. Should I let them? That message travels through the payment network. If you have a Visa card, it goes through Visa's network. MasterCard, same idea. These networks act as the routing layer. They figure out which bank issued your card and forward the request there. Your bank, called the issuing bank, now makes a decision. It checks a few things. Is this card active and not reported stolen? Does this person have enough credit available? Does this transaction look suspicious based on their fraud models? If everything looks good, the bank sends back an approval code. If not, decline. That response travels back through the same network to the merchant's terminal. The whole round trip takes about 200 to 500 milliseconds. You hear the beep, grab your coffee, and you're done. Now, here's the part most people don't realize. Your bank actually sees a ton of data about every transaction. The amount and currency, obviously, but also the merchant's name and category, whether you physically tap the card or type the number online. The GPS coordinates of the terminal, even a unique ID for that specific card reader. Rich, structured data about every purchase you make. But what do you see? Three days later, your statement shows Starbucks $5.40. That's it. All that rich transaction data and you get a one-line summary after the fact. And this is where programmable card flip the model. The entire credit card ecosystem runs on a messaging protocol called ISO 8583. It was created in 1987 and it's still the backbone of almost every card transaction today. Think of it as a standardized format for payment messages. When you tap your card, the terminal packages your transaction into this format. Card number, amount, merchant category, location, how you paid, and dozens of other fields. Every bank in the world knows how to read it because everyone agreed on the structure 40 years ago. So where do programmable cards fit in? They inject a middleware layer into this flow. When an authorization request comes in, instead of going straight to the bank's decision engine, it first hits an API gateway that runs your predefined rules against the transaction in real time. Think of it like a reverse proxy, but for money. The request comes in, your rules evaluate against the transaction metadata, and you return an approve or decline signal before the bank makes a decision. This is technically possible because of how payment networks handle timeouts. You typically have 2-3 to three seconds before Visa or MasterCard considers the request failed. 
and that's enough time to pass the ISO 8583 fields. Run them through custom logic, hit a webhook, even call an external API if you need to. And the data you get access to is rich. Not just Starbucks $5.40, but the merchants category code, whether you tapped or swiped, terminal coordinates, sometimes even the merchant's phone number. Most programmable card platforms expose this data through GraphQL instead of REST. So you can query exactly the fields you need. Add webhooks on top of this and you can build real-time automations. Slack alerts for big purchases, automatic expense categorization, real-time sync to Google Sheet for expense tracking, all without polling or waiting for end-of-day batch files, like traditional bank integrations. So no more waiting for end-of-month statements. Now, this video is sponsored by ClutchCard, and they are actually why I started exploring this topic. ClutchCard is a programmable credit card built for developers, not a business expense card. This is a personal card with a full GraphQL API, webhooks, and something they call mini-apps, which are basically small programs that run against your transactions. Let me show you what that actually looks like. Say you want to stop yourself from impulsive buying on Amazon late at night. With ClutchCard, you can write a rule that declines any e-commerce transaction after 10 p.m. One developer took this further. He made his card decline on the first swipe, waited for him to try again, and only then approve. So every late night purchase requires two attempts, a small friction he added to make himself think twice. Another useful feature is virtual cards. These are card numbers you generate on demand. They are separate from your main card and you can create as many as you want, each with its own spending limit, merchant lock or expiration rule. So if you are signing up for a free trial and don't want surprise charges later, generate a single use card that stops working after one transaction. If you want a dedicated card just for say AWS that alerts you at 80% of your budget, you can set that up in minutes. They also have pre-built mini apps you can install. One tracks all your subscriptions and lets you block the next charge with one tap. Another syncs every transaction to Google Sheets in real time. And if you want to build your own, there's a CLI and JavaScript SDK to do that. And I have definitely signed up for tools I forgot to cancel. Having a card that shows me all active subscriptions in one place and lets me block the next charge without logging into each service, that's useful. I also like the idea of spinning off separate virtual cards for different categories. One for personal, one for business tools, one for ads, each with its own limit. Makes tracking and budgeting way simpler. One thing to note, it's currently US only and it's consumer card, not a business card. The free tier gives you 10 virtual cards a month. Link is in the description, you can explore their API docs before you even apply. Now, some of you might be wondering, how does a startup like ClutchCard actually issues credit cards? They are not bank. And this is where banking as service comes in. It's an architecture pattern that shaped fintech over the last decade. Traditional banks have licenses called charters that let them issue cards and move money through Visa and MasterCard. Getting one takes years and costs millions. And most startups can't do that. So instead, they partner with sponsored banks that already have the charter and plug into middleware platforms that handle card issuing, transaction processing, and ledger management through APIs. It's basically the AWS of banking. You don't build the infrastructure, you rent it. This model is why fintech has exploded in the last few years. Now, there's a lot more to unpack here. How sponsored banks work, the risk involved, and why some banking as service providers have failed. If you want a deep dive on banking as service architecture, let me know in the comments. If you want to try ClutchCard, link is in the description. And if you enjoyed this breakdown, subscribe for more deep dives into system behind products you use every day.